Andrew Morley was introduced yesterday, so and Andrew does not need an introduction. So I'm going to turn it over to my uh, my friend Andrew to talk about the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and their, you know, I, I put a title for his presentation and he's going with it. So uh, looking forward to hearing from Andrew. <laughs> yes, Nabil. Um, <clears throat> took the liberty of uh, titling my presentation for me, so I did think I should go with it. Um, so I, I um, was thinking about this presentation, <clears throat> and um, a bit like uh, John Warney yesterday, when he started his presentation, just sort of reflecting on how to, how to approach uh, this topic and, and what's the best um, way to come at it, and what, what could I tell you that would be most helpful in your work and what you're doing. Um, so what I've tried to do, or will try to do, is to talk a bit about the approach that we've adopted at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation over the last 12 years and um, give you some examples of our work, um, our emerging thinking uh, for 2030, because we've been uh, now working on this for 12 years. The foundation was established in 2010 and um, I think it's, you know, it's fair to say that we've, we've had uh, some influence on the topic, we've managed to get the circular economy idea um, mobilised, and we're now really thinking about how do we uh, be true to our mission, which is to accelerate the transition. Um, so I, wanted, I re really wanted to present to you some of the work in progress that we've got uh, around that thinking, and um, I'd welcome any feedback uh, from you after this if you have... Um, uh, strong views and comments, I'd love to hear them. Um, so we, as I said, were established in 2010. Um, we have a team of around 250 people now based uh, around the world. We have offices in uh, the UK, Europe, Brussels, uh, North America, New York. Uh, we're in Latin America, Brazil. Uh, we're in China, in Beijing. Uh, they're... Um, uh, they're our, uh, our locations, uh, we have those as uh, strategic geographies, that is Europe, um, UK, North America, Latin America and China. Um, we're pretty interested in Africa, but we just don't have the resources to uh, really scale up in a way to be able to have a presence on the ground. It's really quite a challenge to both drive the, the idea and an organisation to execute. And when you get to about 250 people, uh, you have to really think carefully about how you uh, continue to grow and in, and in what ways you grow. Um, we have, um, I think, uh, if you characterise the foundation, I think we would have, um, in self-reflecting, we'd say we've, we've got an unreasonable ambition as an organisation, uh, we're highly driven, and we try to approach our work in a really very uh, creative and innovative way. Um, we're not scientists, um, or we are scientists, some of it. I was trained as a scientist. I, I, I know enough to know the difference between what we do in our analytic work and uh, the peer review publication process. Um, but what we try to do is to bring a mixture of sort of analytic uh, research, thought leadership, uh, creative um, communications, and we're trying to do really um, two things, to develop and promote the idea of a circular economy and, and in doing that, what we're trying to do is to uh, really um, promote the bigger idea of a circular economy on the one hand, and on the other hand, actually uh, help to mobilise scale demonstration cases. So, uh, again, I'll give you some examples of how we do that. Um, so, uh, our approach so far, over the, over the last um, 12 years, we've... We've really um, tried to take a, a different approach uh, as, a, as an NGO, as a charity, um, as a small group of people initially um, focused on this uh, agenda. What we've tried to do is be, be not like most NGOs. We've tried to really bring together a, um, a variety of different ideas and uh, to do something really radically different to uh, actually have an impact. Uh, what we've what we've done here is we've we've built um, a number of options through creating 
a really very large network of businesses that we work with closely. We have around or just under 300 businesses that we contract with on a three-year basis to work with us. Um, we don't do transactional activities. We don't uh, do transactional relationships. We, we, we tend to build long-term relationships with uh, partners. Uh, we have different tiers of, of business, um, businesses in our network. Uh, we have a group of strategic partners who are shown here. Um, and we also work with uh, uh, different levels, partners, members, and, and associates. Uh, beyond the 300, uh, roughly, that we have close to us, we have a further 2,500 that um, are working with us on various initiatives through various uh, platforms around the world, whether those are plastics packs, uh, whether they're fashion initiatives, food initiatives. And we also work with a range of governmental bodies. So we're focused on businesses uh, with the intention of stimulating business innovation for the circular economy. We really do believe that business innovation is crucial to the transition. But we also work with institutes, governments and cities on, on policy issues because we also believe it's absolutely crucial that um, we have enabling policies and enabling conditions to help uh, the innovation take and scale. On the bottom left corner, we work in marketing, Marcom, marketing and communications, and we do a lot of content de development and distribution. So we work on publications, uh, press, social media, video podcasts, etc. Uh, and underneath the, the three circles, you can see that uh, these are some of the areas of activity. So we do a lot of thought leadership. We've done a lot of learning and education programs over the years. I've developed a lot of uh, tools, frameworks. We, we actively work with our business partners to help them uh, develop solutions. We call that solutions activation. Uh, we have some very large initiatives, such as the Plastics Global Plastics Initiative I'll talk a little bit about. And uh, we work in design, as Nabil said, and I want to share a little bit about that as well. Uh, this is uh, a, an illustration of thought leadership that we've published over the last um, 12 years. Uh, this, this 34 major publications here. And there's a variety. Some of them are deeply technical and analytic uh, with extensive modeling of material flows. And um, all of them have a, a consistent theme, though, that what we're trying to do is to really frame uh, this topic and our work around an economic rationale. So we're wanting to, to position this as uh, an economic opportunity and an innovation opportunity. And we, we've put a big effort into quantifying that to, to really show that this is about economics and we need to get the economics to work in order for it to take off. Uh, and we've tried to come at that um, uh, idea in a number of different ways. So we've looked at different sectors, whether it's fast moving consumer goods or whether we've looked at durable goods, we've looked at fashion, plastics, um, we've looked at artificial intelligence, IoT, uh, different markets, China, India, um, and we've looked at uh, issues in terms of the connection of this idea to things like climate change and biodiversity loss. So um, I want to give some examples of, of the way in which, though, we think about our thought leadership, which is, is we're, we're very keen to engage with the system, the actors in the system, and to work with them on the analysis that we do, but also engage them then in mobilising solutions off the back end of that. So uh, the work we did in plastics, the new plastics economy report that we launched uh, at the World Economic Forum in 2016 was really quite a novel approach to uh, engaging with the system to talk about system solutions for what was um, up to then really considered to be a, a waste and uh, waste and um, recycling or, or a waste agenda generally. And what we've tried to do through the work is really to take um, an innovative approach for the formation of the thought leadership um, consortia that we build. So when we did the new plastics economy work, we, we worked very actively across the entire value chain, the polymer manufacturers, the packaging manufacturers, the brands, the cities, the uh, collection agencies, the recyclers. And we brought them together and we talked about solutions for the system as opposed to just looking at better recycling or looking at better collection systems. Uh, so we tried to envisage the solution from an end-to-end -end perspective. Uh, and that was quite novel. Um, we also 
uh, got, when we did the analysis, we also got um, roughly 45 CEOs to fully endorse the report before we published it. So in that report, we talked about uh, the material flow of plastics, um, we talked about the leakage, we talked about the recycling rates, and uh, when we launched the report uh, at the World Economic Forum in 2016, we um, had a communications effort around that that uh, really uh, talked about the fact that there could be more plastics in the ocean than fish uh, by 2050. And we used that as a tagline to launch it, and we did a whole lot of analysis in the background about it, lots of debates about how many fish there are in the sea. Um, but that wasn't really the point. What we wanted to do was really orient uh, people to the scale of the problem um, and to get them to orient to thinking about it as a systems challenge, not just a waste and recycling challenge. Um, and that report, when we launched it, got more press coverage than any report ever released at the World Economic Forum in its history. And uh, that report actually, and the quote uh, that I mentioned, uh, was picked up and uh, was very influential in mobilising the public's uh, understanding of the, of the issue and uh, also mobilising a huge effort into uh, what is now recognised as one of the uh, major global challenges. And um, I think it was the fact that we uh, really approached the topic in a really innovative and different way. If you look at the report, it looks different, it uh, reads differently, it frames the problem differently, uh, it engages the system differently. So it was really quite unique in a number of ways. Since then, we've looked, uh, published a number of other uh, thought leadership pieces in the space. We've looked at reuse. Uh, we established what's called the global commitment. We got to more than 20% of the global plastics packaging producers, um, more than 20% of the volume on market through these producers uh, we got them to sign a global commitment saying that by 2025 they would only put on the market 100% recyclable, uh, compostable or reusable packaging. And more importantly, with that, we also established a reporting process. So for the first time ever, we now can see the volumes on market by these producers annually and the progress they're making against that commitment. We're now working with them on the, uh, on the 2030 uh, global commitment and... Uh, uh, it's fair to say that there's still plenty of challenges there to address, but most importantly, what we've learned is that um, not all plastics are the same uh, and that we need to put an, uh, an enormous focus on uh, the most problematic formats and start to look at how we can address those faster. So, in particular, flexibles, uh, which are, are very difficult to recycle, but in um, developing markets, perhaps more importantly, uh, they're almost impossible to collect, and they're not collected, and they actually end up in the natural environment uh, as a, a cumulative persistent pollution. So we have, uh, you know, trillions of single pieces of flexible packaging now being released and accumulating uh, in these geographies, and it's uh, a problem that has to be addressed because there is no pathway forward, uh, under the, there is no solution pathway understood uh, going forward for addressing this problem. So we're putting quite a lot of urgency into that. And the other is the um, work that we've done with the World Economic Forum in the United Nations to actually establish a, a global plastics a treaty, which is now going into uh, the ratification process over the next two years. Uh, it's a massively accelerated program. Uh, it is a once in a generational opportunity to have a true impact on this problem. Uh, it's really important that we collectively you know, pay attention to this because that will uh, set the direction and the uh, solution, um, I, I guess, the, the road map and, map and, map and timing for uh, execution of solutions over the next um, decades to come. We've formed a, a business coalition for uh, the Global Plastics Treaty, so we've brought together the most ambitious companies who are really calling for policy regulation to level the playing field and to address some of these issues. So if you think about um, plastics, uh, flexible packaging and, and sachets, for example, in developing markets, uh, these are the small format, um, small portions of things like detergents and sauces and, um, and the like, and uh, they are sold at, at, at very small prices so that people can afford them in developing markets. And 
they use the uh, sachet uh, flexible multi-layer pla pa packaging plastics for those. Uh, there are many companies who are now, uh, we're working with, who now recognise that this is a hugely problematic plastics format and it needs to be regulated against. And the reason that these companies aren't prepared to step out of the market right now is because they know if they do that, that the moment that they do it, somebody else will step in and take that market share and, and populate that space. Uh, so what they're calling for is um, regulation that regulates everybody out of this over a time frame and forces innovation at a pace to find solutions uh, that can actually address it. It's super important and it's just one very tiny example of what we need to do in the circular economy agenda to you know, move it forward and accelerate it. But what it does do, it demonstrates a different approach for approaching the problem, uh, for, for addressing the problem and, and uh, for uh, getting this type of, of cross-value chain perspective and the public-private uh, discussions around how we actually address it. So we need private sector innovation to come up with solutions and we need policies to level the playing field and to really force the innovation to drive those through. Um, so that is uh, a really key thing to be watching out for. Consistently over this, we've talked about three uh, messaging uh, points on the plastic agenda. We need to eliminate the unnecessary and most problematic formats and chemicals. Just get it out of the system. There is no need for the ridiculously designed, over-engineered, uh, massively polluting plastics that exist. We just have to get them out of the system. Uh, the second thing is we have to innovate radically on materials and we have to innovate on uh, business models and processes and systems for reuse. Uh, reuse is a huge opportunity space, we believe, but it requires a huge effort to get it off the ground and to move us back away from the disposability agenda. And the third thing is around circularity. So we need to be able to collect, sort and recycle and keep in circulation the polymers, products, plastics, um, and those, these are the necessary materials that, that we actually have to, we, we need in the economy. and. and uh, we need to really address these three things simultaneously uh, and really focus on eliminate, innovate and circulate as the agenda. So just quickly then on other examples, I won't go into these in depth, but the same pattern uh, has been adopted in the fashion space. So we've done a lot of work in fashion, we've worked with fashion designers, fashion brands, we've published a book on fashion design uh, for circularity, uh, we've done re uh, jeans redesign demonstrators, uh, which have had hundreds of companies uh, working with us on. It's about redesigning, thinking about the materials, thinking about the combinations, material combinations, thinking about the design, design for disassembly, design for repair, design for durability, these types of things. Um, and it's really interesting because fashion is a, a terrific space to focus on uh, because of the communications potential it has. A, a hugely problematic space uh, but one that uh, we have been working on uh, consistently over the last few years. The third big topic for us is food. Now, food is, uh, is interesting. Uh, if you um, think about the butterfly diagram, we have the, the, the bio materials and the non-bio materials. Uh, we've, we struggled over the years to really think of a, a distinctive way for us to come into the bio side of the butterfly diagram um, that uh, we hope uh, is able to break through. And we've done a piece of thought leadership on, uh, on what we're calling food design. And what we're trying to do is popularise the thinking of how to design with a, a regenerative intent. So what that means is, so if you think about regenerative agriculture and the focus out there today, largely it's about um, sourcing, uh, in some instances, it's about sourcing uh, materials, uh, sorry, ingredients for food uh, that are grown regeneratively. What we're trying to promote is something a bit further than that, is, which is to say rather than just sourcing regenerative ingredients for products you've already got or products that you design, um, design them with regenerative intent from the outset. So we're, we've given some examples of, of how to do this. We've prototyped and developed uh, concepts, you know, things like climate crunch, sweet up, uh, silvo cheese, uh, to really show that if you take a full value chain perspective on food and you design for regenerative intent uh, from the outset, um, it can have, economically, it can have uh, beneficial outcomes 
um, once you get through the initial stages, uh, and it, uh, it, it can have a profound impact in terms of the way in which you think about uh, food as well as part of a, a, f a bigger food system. Um, just to come back to the topic of design, so we've worked uh, extensively over the years on this uh, with IDEO and other design organisations. Um, the importance of design is, is it takes you right to the beginning of, of the life cycle of a product service system solution and it encourages you to think about um, the way in which you design a product and lock in uh, many of the decisions that uh, then subsequently have a, an impact downstream or through the life cycle of that product. So we've put a huge effort into this over the years. Uh, we're trying to really popularise the, um, the thinking in terms of, of, of design for a circular economy, what we're calling circular design. Uh, we are working with um, many, many of designers in many of the leading organisations. We have what's called the Design Leadership Group, and I just wanted to show you um, a little video that we've uh, got. It just takes a few minutes, but it gives you a sense of the, the type of work we're doing with you know, world-leading brands, world-leading designers to really bring this into the heart of their company's thinking and, um, uh, and their approach to the topic. So with that, do you have a sound on that? I literally was trained as a designer in designing for obsolescence. In other words, I was trained to make sure that the electric appliances we would design would fail at the right point that the consumer liked them, but they'd still fail, so they'd come back and buy a new one. For the last three days, we came together as a group of companies and organizations thinking about how our organizations can be more circular and more regenerative. And if that intent shifts to making something circular, making something regenerative, every design, every innovation becomes an opportunity to get closer to that desired future. How do we change people's minds? How do we tell great stories? How do we offer people solutions that bring about a different world? exploring what does a regenerative economy look like and how can designers get us there. So we've been taking them through immersion in the forest systems and being in the forest, being there experiencing the incredible in ingenuity of nature. We looked at future building and thinking about our visions for organisations of the future, what the design function would look like. A sort of meditative journey through time into the future, walking around the design departments, imagining what, what people are up to. Moving into sort of more practical prototyping and then storytelling, so how do we tell the story about the kind of vision that we have and how do we bring our prototype to life. Everyone is already starting to translate that into who are the stakeholders within their organisations and within their systems that they want to try and influence. How can I impact my organisation at Coca-Cola, which is a huge company? How can I implement things that we discussed here in a piloting that have people buying in and then make it bigger, you know? We looked at culture, we looked at mindsets, we looked at skills and capabilities they would need. I would say one of the key fundamentals in a circular economy is the paradigm shift from competitive to collaborative. In order to get there, we have to build massive sets of new infrastructure. We talked about, you know, the, the whole idea or notion of natural capital. Work with your supply chain, your value chain, your local ecosystem to effectively widen the scope of value creation beyond economic profit alone. Designers are really strong to create alternative world, imaginary uh, world, place where we basically will be attracted to live in. I think the role of designers is to be the provocateurs, call things out and say, we need to be bolder. This is what the future could look like. Let's imagine that together. From there, designers are brilliant and starting to shape what these futures could look like, starting to get everyone on board to believe that that future is possible through our skills and making and creating and shaping and building. These steps that the participants are taking to their organizations are sort of seeds. It would be great for my company also to really kind of broaden some of the relationships that we've got out of this. And ideas around or what can we do together. There might be some collaborative projects that spin out of this. Let's have these design leaders bring, bring about an evolution in their organisation, but doing that in a collaborative sense. I mean, it would just be interesting to meet like in six months and understand from what we did now, what have you done and, you know, what kind of discussions have you had in, in your organisation and how have it landed so far? This interaction is probably the recipes for building a group 
regenerative uh, movement, maybe. You know, maybe it's maybe bold, but that's really what I would like to see to come. So we work with companies extensively to try to provide context for what you're doing. We're trying to promote this into the um, actors in the system who can take up the ideas uh, and the technologies and the, and the thinking approaches to innovate faster. We bring people together with meetings like our annual summit, but we also use this as a mechanism for building content that we can distribute uh, through various channels. We do various uh, innovation events that bring together startups and financiers and uh, incumbents. Uh, these are uh, very dynamic and active events. Um, and they're, they're important in shaping how we've thought about, um, you know, where do we go to from here? So just in the, um, uh, in the time available, I just wanted to give you a sense of, you know, where we're now going with this having uh, done, I think, two things. You know, the two things we've done is to mobilise the topic of the circular economy. It's the reason we're in the room today, I think, and many other organisations are working on this idea. And the other thing we've done is we've, we've changed the discussion around plastics um, on, the, on the planet. What next? So I think, you know, what we're trying to do over the next few years is to really mainstream this bigger idea of what a circular economy is. Many people think of it still as a waste and recycling agenda or a waste agenda. And we've got to move them upstream and we've got to talk about this as a system solutions framework uh, that aims to both uh, eliminate and circulate non-biological materials and regenerate biological ones all by design. So that's the agenda. We've got to re-establish the economic rationale and really make it really clear that this is where we should be investing capital and work out how do we identify how to allocate that capital to get this whole idea moving faster. The third thing is that we want to elevate the topic of regenerative design. Elevate regen is what we're calling it. And it's to move just be beyond just looking at nature positive, which is coming up the agenda, and proactively build positive intention into the economy for nature positive outcomes. The third thing, uh, the fourth thing is we want to um, shift the focus upstream, focus on regenerative design. We're putting a lot more effort into design that, that I've already showed you. But the fifth thing is um, we need to continue to scale and drive impact on material circularity, particularly in the plastic space. You know, we need to make, we need to get a win in plastics over the next couple of years. So they're the five um, topics that we're focused on. And really, I just wanted to say that, you know, many people have recognised the butterfly diagram as uh, an important um, imagery, uh, important uh, piece of imagery that relates to the uh, the idea of a circular economy. What we're what we're trying to do is to help people to move from you know just thinking about it in the technical spheres. So these are examples of hundreds and hundreds of uh, butterfly diagram um, derivatives that have emerged over the last few years. Uh, there are hundreds of them, but what you'll notice is that almost all of them are just on the a technical non-biomaterial side. We need to fix that and we need to bring people back to the bigger idea and say these two things are interrelated and they're important to think about as a total system. So we're trying to move from the butterfly diagram to what we're calling ECR by D. So the eliminate, circulate and regenerate by design. Very, very simple messaging around the system solution framework and uh, we put this on into the market around the uh, COP26 in Glasgow, and within six months there were hundreds of thousands of references of it uh, on the internet and uh, through other sources. So we know that we can influence the language that's used. Uh, not everybody understands what it means, uh, but that's the first step to say the words, and we'll get them there eventually. We need to, you know, activate uh, solutioning around some of the topics, so particularly the food re redesign, and we've got a challenge launching in May that'll run for a couple of years with all of the, uh, well, sorry, with many of um, our uh, major food producing companies who are going to renovate some of their iconic products uh, and to renovate them in the sense of redesigning the ingredients for more biodiverse ingredients that are sourced regeneratively. And we're going to look at startups that are actually um, designing food products in this way and massively promote this idea over the next couple of years. And we're also, if you come back to the uh, network that we've got, the 300 closest partners that we've got, we're starting to talk to them about the built environment. 
And as I said yesterday, if, you know, the only living thing in this room is human, uh, what we need to do is to bring nature into the built environment and design the built environment to have a nature positive intent, but also to design it specifically for the ecosystems it sits in to be regenerative as well. So every one of the companies we're working with has a huge built environment footprint around the globe and what we're going to be working on with them over the next few years is to bring regenerative design and nature positive intent into their built environments and to action that as quickly as possible. So, you know, if you think of it in terms of target outcomes, where do we want to be by 2030? Take this as a, you know, start of a 10. We're still working out the numbers. But, you know, we need evidence of the big idea being mainstream, you know, be taken into the, um, into the, into the common lexicon by references, audience reach engagement, uh, the number of circular products on market. So we want to measure that. We want to see the bigger idea being taken into the mainstream. Secondly, we want to see scale impact on material circularity. So we think we've uh, taken probably in the order of 9 to 10 million tonnes of plastics off the market to date over the last five years through our efforts. That's actually quite a lot. Um, what we need to do, though, is get to 100 million by 2030 off the market. 100 million other... Um, tons of virgin materials off the market, that is, they're avoided. We need to actually be regenerating and having a regenerative impact on hundreds of, hundreds of millions of hectares, and we need to mobilise in the order of a trillion dollars by 2030. And these seem like, you know, inconceivably big numbers for a small organisation to drive, but we believe that order of magnitude, that's something that we should be going after as an ambition, uh, and we should be able to achieve. Don't hold me to it right now. We're going to come back and lock down the numbers. Um, and so how are we going to do this? We're going to focus on what we're strong at, what we're good at, the business, the policy, the, um, the mind, uh, the Marco and media development. You know, we're trying to drive uh, change in practice, drive enabling conditions and policies to, to bring this to life, uh, and to shift mindsets. So we're going to particularly be focusing on the intersection between business and policy and doing more specific work in that space. Uh, we're going to be raising the ambition of our network and helping them to drive solutions uh, out faster. Uh, we're going to be field building, that is, we're going to be helping other organisations that work on the circular economy topic and help them to be stronger at doing that, continue to drive thought leadership, work on reference metrics, uh, and mobilise the finance sector. We partner with BlackRock, Morgan Stanley, several other banks. We're, we're moving on that hard. Uh, but interestingly, the other thing we're going to be doing is expanding and en engaging a, a broader target audience. You know, I haven't talked really much about numbers at all. We could easily. Uh, what we need to do is we need to, we need to inspire people. We need to orient them to the vision and the solutions. We need to tell stories that inform, inspire and engage and entertain them. And we need to bring the ideas to life so people can imagine what a circular regenerative economy looks like. So we're partnering with a, uh, a company called Waterbear. If you don't know about it, look it up. Waterbear is the Netflix for nature. Um, they're moving away from that title, but that's, it's free. You go there and it's a huge amount of documentary content and fabulous filmmaking. Uh, we're working with them. Uh, we're going to be uh, partnering with them to put content into their distribution panels, uh, channels. They're, they're on smart uh, televisions and, and on uh, devices. They're a digital first company. We're going to be doing a lot more in that space uh, over the coming years, so uh, watch out for that. Um, and I just wanted to say, in closing, um, this is incredibly inspiring for me to be here with you today. Um, this is an extraordinary development from where we set out from 12 years ago. And I think what we, you know, the, the nature of the conversations that have been had, uh, the progress that's been made, it's really quite extraordinary. Uh, today, I have um, my team in Amsterdam uh, with our net business network, 500 people. These are photographs that I got sent this morning from the event that's going on right now. Um, we have this group coming together every six months we have a, you know, an enormous amount of energy and development going on around this space. Um, I understand that the Circularity 23 in, in May uh, that Green Biz is putting on will have around 1,500 people at it this year. Uh, we have our annual summit that I mentioned in June, on June the 15th. We'll have over 1,000 people at that. 
Uh, we will record it. We will reach more than 10 million people with that content within months of it being broadcast. Uh, we are going to focus on digital methods, digital marketing, using AI. Um, we are going to be getting this message out into the mainstream. Our ambition is to get to 50 million households 24 by 7, 365 with circular economy visionary content within very short order. Um, this is exciting. I think it's, it's encouraging. And um, I just want to leave you really with this. You know, this, it's my gift to you to take home. Think of it as a can opener. Whatever aspect of the problem you're working on, reference it back to this. This is what we're trying to do. This is the problem that we need to be working on together. And we need to be talking about the circular economy in terms of system solution framework for circular, uh, for non-biological and biological. Uh, we need to be eliminating, circulating, and we're doing all of that by design. Thank you. Well, thank you, Andrew, for sharing the vision for the Ellen MacArthur Foundation for the Future. It's really very impressive to see um, how far the foundation has gone from uh, in 2011 to today. It, it just, it just fantastic growth. 